So as you've noticed, we've been spending a lot of time talking about Mars in this class. And I hope you realize that, of course, it's not really Mars that we're studying. I mean, yes, we're interested in Mars. Maybe you're not. I personally am. I think it's a very interesting place, and I think that the search for life on another planet is absolutely fascinating. But really what we're doing, whether you're interested in Mars or not, is looking at how life is organized. And the reason that we're using Mars as an example is because we're looking for life on another planet, and we don't know what that life is going to be like. And we only have reference to life on this planet. So our goal really is to try to get a sense for what life is really like in a fundamental way. I honestly can't think of a better way to start a biology class than that problem. So that's why we start there. What I want to do now is come back to the Earth a little bit later. Because the beginnings of life, as we talked about in the Miller-Urey experiment, is fascinating and interesting and, and so on. But there's much, much, much more to life than just that. Because now we have, for example, many, many organisms on this planet. There's been all, approaching 3 million organisms described on this planet. We think there's at least 5 million. There could be as many as 30 million. So there's a lot of life, a lot of variation of life on this planet. So we need to start getting into that. So what I want to do is come back to the Earth and look at it in a slightly different way than today. I want to look at it at a, t at a different time. I'm not going to go all the way back to 4.3 billion years like we did before, but what I want to do is go back 2.5 billion years, or between 2 and 2.5. And, and if we were to go to the Earth at that time, you would still need a spacesuit, but you would notice something different. First of all, the Earth is much cooler than it was. The surface is not molten, and it's more or less like it, like it is today, except for one key difference, and that is there's nothing living on the surface. All things that are alive, and there are things that are alive by this time, there's none of them living on the surface of the planet. There are no plants, animals, insects, various sorts of animals and insects are the same. But there are things living in the, in the waters, in the oceans, lakes, and streams. And for example, we look at these, these things here, these are critical things. They look like giant pillow-shaped rocks, but they're not. They're actually constructed by a type of prokaryotic organism called a the cyanobacteria. They're called stromatolites, and that's these structures here. Stromatolites are really interesting because what we find is this. At the time that we start to see stromatolites in the fossil record, we also start to see rust in the rocks. Now, remember what I said before. When you have rust in rocks, what does that tell us? That tells us that there's oxygen free in the atmosphere, gaseous oxygen, O2. So these two things correlate, the rise of the stromatolites in the fossil record and the rise of, of rust in the rocks. So are they related? They're correlated. Correlation doesn't necessarily mean they actually are causative. One causes the other. It just means that they happened at the same time. But here's what we know. Stromatolites still exist on the planet today. You can see them. And what they are are a bunch of photosynthetic bacteria, and guess what they do? They produce oxygen. And these, this is the first real evidence of major oxygen production on the Earth. So this is what we think. These stromatolites began about two to two and a half billion years ago, started cranking out oxygen, and making the atmosphere into what it is today. Otherwise, the atmosphere is remarkably like Mars, although it had a ton of nitrogen in it instead of CO2 like Mars does. But still... This thing right here is what's producing the oxygen that could have been breathed by that time. Now, at this time, there was not enough oxygen for you to live on it, but there, there was definitely oxygen increasing. So that by the time we get to 2 billion years ago, you could live on the Earth without a, without a spacesuit. So this is the rise of life. Life really began of this sort. Not plants, not animals, not fungi, but these prokaryotic organisms. So what we want to do now is take a closer look and what the prokaryotic uh, organisms are like. So here's what they're like. This is an electron micrograph of a bacillus bacteria, a single bacterium that uh, is one living organism, and it's a prokaryote. Now, remember in one of the earlier lectures, I asked you to list all the differences be that you know of between prokaryotic organisms and eukaryotic organisms. And if you looked up one of the differences, what you, what you would have found is that we often teach in junior high and high school Prokaryotes uh, are different from eukaryotes because they lack a nucleus, and eukaryotes have a nucleus. But the professional view is different. The professional view is, yeah, that's true, but there's a reason why it's true. And the reason is because prokaryotic cells lack a critical structure called a cytoskeleton, the cell skeleton. 
And that cytoskeleton, which is made out of proteins we're going to talk about here shortly, is what constructs the nucleus. It also constructs many other structures in the cells that we call organelles. Therefore, prokaryotic cells, because they don't have cytoskeletons, don't have nuclei, but they also don't have other organelles. So this is a critical point. The key difference between prokaryotic cells like this one and eukaryotic cells like the cells in your skin or your body is that this one does not have a cytoskeleton. What does it have? Well, okay, so it doesn't have a nucleus, but does it have DNA? Now we know in eukaryotic cells, our cells have a nucleus and they have DNA in them. Does this have DNA or does it not have DNA? Well, if we look here, you'll see all this light colored material in this micrograph, all this light stuff. All of that is DNA. So this organism has DNA, it just doesn't have a nucleus. And therefore, the DNA is just spread throughout the organism's body, if you will. It's pretty common knowledge that the DNA in your cells is packaged up in the form of these things called chromosomes. A little less well known that the DNA is not the only thing that makes up the chromosomes. Proteins do as well. We'll see that structure here shortly. But we are eukaryotes. What about these prokaryotes? Do they have chromosomes? And if so, are their chromosomes organized the same way ours are? The answers to those questions are yes and no. Yes, they do have chromosomes. No, it's packaged differently and it's structured differently. So we look here, we see all this light colored material, and we just saw that that's all DNA. What you're looking at here is one giant chromosome. And that giant chromosome is very different than ours. And our chromosomes, they're linear structures. They're just these long linear things. We'll see that here shortly. These are different. These structures are more like this. They're like this uh, rubber band here. They're circular. And this one giant chromosome is this blob of this circular chromosome. It's all spread throughout the entire body of this organism. In addition to the huge chromosome, the one huge chromosome, it also has a number of small plasmids. And these plasmids are also circular. And there can be any number of the plasmids in there. And you can't really see them in this picture because they're too small. But the plasmids are kind of critical for a lot of the physiology of this organism. For example, antibiotic resistance that occurs in many types of bacteria are carried by genes that are on these plasmids, not on the main chromosome. So, these chromosomes here, in addition to being circular as opposed to being uh, uh, linear, are also packaged differently. And I'm going to talk about that here very shortly. But before we do that, I want to take a look inside this organism and also ask this question. What structures are inside here? If you look, this isn't just a uniform color. It's not just all light colored stuff. There's a bunch of dark colored stuff all over the place as well. What are those things? We might be tempted to look at those and fall back on what we've learned elsewhere, then call these things organelles. But they're not, technically. The reason they're not organelles is because prokaryotes don't have a cytoskeleton. Remember, that's the key difference. The cytoskeleton is responsible for making structures inside cells that are membrane-bound, bound around with a membrane. And these things here are not membrane-bound. Therefore, technically, they're not organelles. By the definition of organelle, they have to have a membrane. But you can still see structures. So what are these things? Well, if we look on the outside here, you can see a bunch of stuff sort of sticking off like a halo around this organism. And that halo is what's called the calyx. I'm not going to talk much about the calyx. Really what this is is just a bunch of proteins and sugars that are attached to the outside of the animal's uh, body, organism's body, not animal. And you can see here uh, at the base of the calyx is this dark curve that goes all the way around the organism's uh, uh, outline. That dark curve is really two structures, one you can see and one you can't. The one you can see is the cell wall. The one you can't, attached right to it, is the cell membrane. Okay, now, what's the difference between a cell wall and a cell membrane? Do you have cell walls? Do you have cell membranes? Do all organisms have cell walls? Do all organisms have cell, have cell membranes? Those are all questions I want you to be able to answer very shortly. Here's the summary of how all this is, is organized. All organisms, including you and plants, fungi, all the different organisms, have these things that we call plasma membranes or cell membranes. Not all organisms have cell walls. The difference between a cell membrane and a cell wall is that the cell membrane is very much more flexible and nowhere near as strong as a cell wall. The cell walls tend to be much more rigid. They might be a little bit elastic. You can deform them a little bit, uh, but they are generally not uh, 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 at all really bendable. Whereas plasma membranes actually are. The difference really is this. The membranes are made out of soap. 
Membranes themselves, therefore, are, in a very real sense, soap bubbles. So a lot of our intuition about how cell membranes work is really generated by our intuition about soap bubbles. For example, you have two soap bubbles, you bring them together, what happens? Well, if they touch and they don't pop, then they'll fuse into one giant soap bubble. And we have technologies where we do that. We take cells and we fuse them together because their they're cell membranes are soap bubbles that allows us to do that. Now, one thing you got to realize, too, soap bubbles in air are very unstable. So when you see soap bubbles floating around, they pop very easily. And that's one of the reasons why they're fun for kids. But the same exact soap bubble in water is extremely stable. The water stabilizes it and holds it together. And it has to be the right kind of soap. The soap that it's made out of, the soap that the membranes are made out of, is a soap that's called phospholipid. And it really is a soap. It's the stuff you could go to the store today right now and buy a box of phospholipid soap to wash your clothes. It's the same stuff out of which your membranes are made. Now, again, the cell membranes that are extremely thin act like soap bubbles, and they really are that because they're made out of soap, but they also have proteins in them. We're going to see the structure of membranes later on in the course. Cell walls, on the other hand, are extremely rigid, and they are made out of different types of material in different organisms. For example, in plants, the cell walls are made out of cellulose. You know cellulose by another name. You call it wood. It's the same stuff. The cellulose is extremely rigid, as you know wood is, and it burns very easily and so forth. Why? Well, it's mostly sugar. It's actually sugar, as we saw in the, uh, in the laboratory. And it's extremely rigid. Other cell walls and other organisms are not quite as rigid. For example, fungi. Also, their cell walls are made out of a sugar, but the sugar is called chitin. And there's the word right there, C-H-I-T-I-N. It's not chitin, it's chitin. That is a kind of a rubbery sugar. So that's, that's why the, uh, the cell walls and, and the, the, of the fungi, the mushrooms that you buy at the store, have the, the property that they, that they have. They're not woody. They're, they're kind of, of flexible. And there are other things, peptidoglycans, that's a fancy word, it's actually a compound word. Peptide, as you know, means amino acid or polypeptide. Glycan means sugar. So this is a combination of protein and sugar. And it also can be very rigid or can be slightly flexible like the, like the chitin is. But that's the difference. Cell walls are rigid and these plasma membranes are very thin and act like a soap bubble. So when we look at this, this big thick thing right here is a peptidoglycan cell wall around this bacteria and the cell membrane is pressed directly to it, and again, you can't really see it. So now let's look inside this organism, and you'll see, again, a bunch of structures on the inside that are not organelles. A lot of them are dark staining in this particular image, and for example, there's this and that and the other thing. Well, some of these are starch grains, some of them are other types of things, but the little tiny black dots in here are these things, and they're represented in this cartoonish image as sort of these yellow dots all over the place, and these things are ribosomes. Now, when it comes right down to it, when you ask someone what's the most important structure of life, a lot of people would say chromosome or DNA and so on. Ultimately, I think it really comes down to this, the ribosomes. In fact, there's some evidence that the very first living things were really nothing more than free ribosomes. It didn't even have a cell. And ribosomes are really important because they produce the most important molecule that life is based on on this planet. And we talked about that before. Life is based not on DNA. Life is really based on proteins. They are the structures that produce the proteins. Now, if we power up on this, what I'm going to do is take an electron micrograph, a microscope and go really, really detailed into this organism, and we'll see this. These blobs right here are the ribosomes. And you can see this ribosome, for example, is attached to this string right here. That thing looks like a really, really thin string. That thin string is a molecule of RNA, and this ribosome is currently looking and reading that uh, RNA strand and producing a protein from it. So that's what these things are. Ribosomes are cell structures. They're not technically organelles, although we often call them organelles. Technically not. Again, the organelles, remember, are things that have to have a membrane around them. These guys don't have a membrane. They're made out of protein and RNA, and that's basically it. They're, they're structures that are also compound. There's more than one structure associated with this, but together it forms this thing called a ribosome and they construct all the proteins in the cell. So what's interesting is if you look at a cell, a cell has proteins in it not because it ate the proteins. Typically what it does is it takes the proteins in, if it does that, breaks them down into their constituent amino acids and then rebuilds the proteins that it needs. It doesn't find the proteins it needs out in the environment and eat it. So these things are absolutely critical. You can't have a living system as far as we know that's protein based without something like a ribosome that's gonna produce the proteins directly. So that's 
one of the key things. That's why we start really with living things are really based on ribosomes because the ribosomes are what's producing the proteins. Okay, now the question then is, what about the DNA? We talked about how the DNA is sort of packaged differently. If you look at the DNA inside these bacteria, you'll see that that big, huge chromosome is coiled up and coiled up and coiled up into these structures here. Now, what you're looking at here is not DNA as a double helix. What you're looking at here is DNA that's been coiled up and coiled up. Let me explain how that uh, operates with this. This is a, uh, a standard uh, just rubber band. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to twist it. If I twist it and twist it and twist it, then I'm coiling it. All right? Now, that is just a single coil. But if I take this and continue to coil, if you've ever done this, you've probably seen this before. If I continue to coil and continue to coil, it starts to do this. It starts to coil on itself. See that? It's just now starting to coil. So the coils are coiling on themselves. That's called supercoiling. And that's how the DNA in prokaryotic cells is packaged. It's packaged up into the supercoiled sort of blob. Same thing with the, with the plasmids. And that's how it's organized, which is very, very different than eukaryotic cells, which is what we're going to talk about next.